Good morning, everyone. It is so counterintuitive for me. I'm a hugger, Nikki, as well. And so to not move towards you when I first meet you is just so uh, weird. Weird. So I drove uh, down yesterday. Uh, the rain wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I didn't get away till 4 o'clock. I wanted to stay and watch a little bit of the Alabama-Tennessee game. Uh, I hope that you will treat me better than Nick Saban treated us. Uh, although I was not surprised. I think it's been 14 years now that you've shown no Christian spirit at all. <laughs> Every now and then, you know, you give the dog a bone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. I, 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 I tell you how I felt driving out from Jacksonville this morning. I felt like I was going back home. I, uh, I say that because I, my father was a pastor. We moved around a lot. Uh, I think I lived six years longer, uh, the, was the longest I stayed at any one church. He was a Southern Baptist pastor back in the day and uh, we grew up that way and I love the church. That's all I've ever known. Uh, I became a pastor as a sophomore at Belmont College which is now Belmont University. It's right in Nashville. My dad had taken a church in Middle Tennessee, and that was a natural place for us to go. And so I went there. My dad graduated from there, in fact. Um, I did. My brother did. My sister did. My other brother. And my three sons. And I met my wife there. While I was a sophomore, I pastored my first church. Can you imagine? A sophomore in college pastoring a church, Dry Creek Baptist Church, just past Possum Holler Road <laughs> in DeKalb County. Then I went to seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and I pastored a church in Shepherdsville, Emmanuel Baptist, just south, right down 65. Moved out there and lived in the parsonage and did my graduate work there, postgraduate work enjoyed it. Then we moved to Mount Carmel in 1982 and I stayed there for 32 years. So I pastored over 40 years but just three churches. And Cross Plains was, uh, when I got there, we had $70,000 budget and ran about 100 folks. And I had some of the best farmers, big dairy farmers, school teachers. It's a wonderful place to raise three sons. And uh, Stayed there 32 years and loved every minute of it. The last six years I've been doing this, uh, helping coaches, uh, churches, coaching churches toward health and vitality. And I've come alongside some of the finest folks and I have enjoyed the work. You know what turns my crank? Helping people get from A to B, from B to C. When that happens, that is satisfying to me. So I'm, I'm really excited about being with you during this time of transition. I've got a scripture I want you to read with me. And I have a question that I want to ask you. And it emerges right from this text. Why not? Why not? So would you read it? With me? Let's read it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I've been in a lot of churches over the last several years. I was only in really three <laughs> as a pastor. But I've been in a bunch of churches over the last six, seven years now. And I've not been in one church that hasn't been anxious. You know what I mean? 
when I say that? Just a bit off center, a bit uh, in a strange place, there's this feeling of anxiety, ambiguity really. You know, what's the future going to be like for the church? What are we coming to? Where are we headed? What will it be for my children and grandchildren? And the older I get, I'm 64, the older that I get, the more concerned about that, about the future I am for the sake of those that I love. Anybody get what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, we, we all recognize it. It's this unknown, ambiguity, uh, Call it what you like. It is absolutely true, not just for you, but for every church across the American landscape. It's true in the 21st century. You know, within the church, most of us now, especially those who are the youngest among us, well, look around. We're getting a little white-headed. Churches are aging Younger generations are not coming percentage-wise as they once did. And if we were honest, we really would like it. If, you know, if someone, hey, Bill, could you do it? We'd like for somebody to come along with a little magic pixie dust, you know, and sprinkle it on us and take us right back the way it used to be. Because that's what we knew. That's what we hold dear. I mean, I have those feelings when I sing those hymns that we just sang. But the day is different, isn't it? Without a doubt. And I, I want you to know this, for your next pastor, it's true for every pastor who serves today in a congregation like or unlike this one, it is difficult to be a pastor today. It is complex, to say the least. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about the, the diversity in our nation right now, politically, economically, racially. I mean, you, you name it. We're all over the map, right? And churches are not, we're representative of that, even in places like Williams. We all come with a different story, a different past, a background, and we bring that into here and we're one big pie, but I'll tell you we're more like gumbo than we are apple pie. Because people are funny, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. So it's no wonder when we all get together and we look around and realize that not everybody in this room, even in this room, thinks the way I do. So there's this anxiety. So I want us to, to look at this, this text that we've just read because I, I, I think this text has something to say to us right where we are today in this time of transition. Uh, I want to remind you that Hebrews is unique. It's not like the other epistles. In fact, some say it's not an epistle or letter at all. It's a sermon. It's located at the end of the collection of Paul's letters, but most people say, most scholars agree, it's not even really a letter. It's more a sermon, and Paul didn't write it either. We're not really sure, but we do know this pretty sure, that the Christians that are being addressed in this sermon... They lived just after the time that Jesus walked on the face of this earth, just a few decades. And they find themselves in a high anxiety state, just like we do. And many of them are being tempted. They were Jewish Christians. And they were being tempted to go back to the faith of their fathers. To go back as it were, because they were unsettled, because they were anxious. These early believers found themselves, this will ring true to us, they found themselves torn between the good old days and the challenges of living in a new day as a follower of Jesus. Hebrews, above all else, 
points to the core values of early Christian followers. The core positives, I like to say. And because I like, and you'll find out, we'll talk about this. What we're going to do together over the next few months, we're not going to do a bunch of problem solving. We're going to do a lot of building on our strengths. We're going to take a good look in the mirror at ourselves and say, hey, we do this well. Hey, this has bubbled up in our history. As we think back about the best selves that we were in the glory days, what is it that we could carry forward into this new day from our rich heritage? That's what Hebrews is about. You and I are called to be on the move. We're not called to sit where we were, but to get up and go where Jesus is going. We're followers, learners, disciples of Jesus Christ. So hear these words again in that context. Should we go back, church, or should we follow Jesus forward? You, te- you decide. Let's run the race that's laid out in front of us. Since we've got this great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, throw off, church, every baggage. Get rid of the sin that might trip us up. And fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Yeah. Why not? Why not, church? Why not during this time of anxiety? Why not when you're fearful? Why not when you're anxious? Why not during this transition? Why don't we decide together to throw off anything that would keep us from following Jesus? Why not? Why not run the race that is laid out before us? There's this great cloud of witnesses, the scripture says. Do you get that? Do you get that? Who are they? And what does this witnessing mean to us today? Well, you know, they're the saints, right? They're the saints that have lived and died so valiantly by faith. They're the ones mentioned in chapter 11 that hall of faith as we often refer to it Abel Enoch Noah Abraham Sarah Moses the list goes on all of those that suffered and died the scripture says of whom the world is not worthy in other words these were top shelf folks these were people of faith and rightfully so the scripture says that this cloud of witness This cloud of saints is witnessing to us. Now, does that just mean that they're standing over, you know, peering over the edge of the cloud and looking down on Williams and saying, yep, there they are. They're still hanging in there. I don't think so. What does this witnessing mean? Does it mean they're just watching us to see what we're going to do? See if we make it? See if we can hang on? Or does it refer to the what they're saying to us, speaking to us, witnessing to us by their lives. The word witness, frankly, can mean either watching or speaking. It can mean either one. I think it means they're telling us something. I think it's, I, I think in 11.4, if you, if you go back this afternoon and read chapter 11, you'll find out that when, when the writer speaks of Abel, he says, though he died, he's still speaking through faith. That's what he says. So what do you think they're saying to us? Go for it. Go for it. You can do this, church. I know you're scared. I know you're anxious. We don't know who the next pastor's going to be. You can do this, though. That's what they're saying. You can do this by faith. By faith, you can finish. You can. I'm here to tell you you can. And I'm going to encourage you every step of the way. So why not, church? Why not? Why not finish well? I wish it were as easy as that. I guarantee you Jeremy Pruitt fired them up before they went hit took the field yesterday. But that's not enough. In other words, I'm not enough for you. Don't don't depend on me. I'll tell you this. 
You're the expert on Williams, I'm not. <laughs> Duh. I, I'm not coming in here with a, a satchel or a, a folder with, you know, a paint by numbers thing that says, hey, do this and you'll make it. Doesn't work that way. I'm going to coach you. You're the expert. I'm, I'm good with process. We're going to do some healthy, good stuff together as a church to help us get there. But you're the expert, not I. But you know what happens to churches is, is we get built up. We, we carry around so much baggage from the past that we can't hardly move forward. We're trying to pull everything that we've always done with us. We're trying to, you know, please Sally and Joe over here and this one there, and they remember it the way that was. And, you know, churches are good at keeping everybody happy. It's hard when you carry that much baggage and try to follow Jesus at the same time. Church, we're going to have to throw off some baggage. That's what Scripture says, right? Let us throw off any baggage, get rid of any sin that might trip us up. Why not? Why not? Why not lay aside every weight? Why not let go of the sin that clings to every one of us? By faith, by the assurance of things hoped for, you can do this. You can be the church, the body of Christ in this community. But to do that, folks, uh, to do that, we're going to have to go to God. We're going to have to practice what I would call, and many before me have called, spiritual discernment. It, it can't be what I want. It can't be what you want. It can't be what the deacons want. It can't be what any one family wants. It has to be what God wants. Now, I want to. I, I want to show. Well, I don't know how that got in there. But, well, those pictures—they just show up like that. That's my wife, Cindy, and uh, she's a retired special needs teacher, high school teacher. All right, we we have special special friends. One or two that are on the wall in our house that are like our children. And uh, she's been my right hand. We have three sons. That's their family. We have nine grandchildren. I'll tell you why I do this, because I want the church to be healthy for them. And that's why I'm working to do that. The oldest one on the left and the youngest son on the right, Brandon and Barrett, they're both pastors. When I tell you we love the church, we love the church. And Blake in the middle is a home builder in Nashville, and right now he's killing it. And he's head of the properties committee and a youth teacher at First Baptist Nashville. And Barrett and Brandon, I tell you, he's the best one of the three. Everybody knows pastors are messed up. <laughs> That's why I love the church. It's why I want to say to you that anything and everything you can do to seek God's will during this time will serve you better than anything else I will tell you. discernment Th that's the capacity you know you know what it is it, discernment is the capacity to see what God is up to among us and around us you know I, I pastored it was pretty simple the way I pastored I led the church to see what God was doing within us and outside of us and to join him in that work I'm going to ask you over these months together to look inward, outward, to see where God is calling us so that we can follow him. If we can align ourselves with what God is doing in here and out there, then we will move toward health and well-being. And I'll tell you this, a pastor will want to be where God is at work, serving. There is a, there's a phrase that you'll hear me speak of, and I wanted to mention it today. It's from a, a guy named Ignatius back in the 16th century. And his language, it, it ran along these lines. It, it, it's, it's, it's cognitively 
dissonant. In other words, it's counterintuitive. It's a, what? What does that mean? Holy indifference. That almost sounds like I'm saying be indifferent to things that are holy. It's the opposite of that. I want to be indifferent toward anything and everything except God's will. You get that? You get that? Now, that's a big ask. That's every day's work for a church and for every one of us. Can you see God in everything around you? Finding God in this person, in that stranger, in this time in the life of our church. That's what we want to do. Every Christian is called to this kind of life. Seeking God. It's the mark, really, of Christian maturity. It's a spiritual gift. So I want you to begin with me together. Let's begin praying that we could be indifferent during this time. I know that's hard, that's hard to do. Let's begin praying that we'll be indifferent to my preferences for the sake of God's will for the life of our church. Now, I get it. You didn't have to, you didn't have to pay me to drive down here from Nashville. There are plenty of smart people in this room that could hire our next pastor. I, bet, I imagine there are people in here who hire and fire people for a living. You could do that. That's called human decision making. I'm sure you could do that. You've made decisions without God before. We all have. But I want to tell you that's not the path toward becoming the church that God wants you to be. No, what we want to do is discern God's will for this next season in the life of the church. That's what we want to do. It, in the Gospel of Luke, there, there are a couple of prayers that I, I'll just mention to you today and we'll come back to them again I'm sure there's Mary's prayer in the very first chapter they're kind of these prayers are like Nikki they're kind of like bookends in the gospel Mary you, you, you know Mary young girl you're gonna have a baby nope <laughs> I know better I'm not gonna have a baby yeah 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 the spirit's gonna come on you're gonna have a baby and Mary then prayed, okay, let it be to me according to your will. That's the prayer of indifference, right? And then you know the prayer I'm going to in the, at the end of the Gospel of Luke in Gethsemane when Jesus prays and agonizes. And, and you know, that, that, that Gethsemane story, go back and read it again. It, it is obvious that even Jesus had preferences because he prayed more than once let this cup pass from me and and believe me there's going to be a lot of that kind of praying going on during the transition no I think we need a 30 year old no I think we need a person with more experience no I think we need, there'll be plenty of preferences and even Jesus read and it I, that's going to be difficult work but it's discerning work how did Jesus end up what did he pray? Not my will, but thy will be done. That's what I'm asking you this morning. Why not pray that prayer? Why not? I'll tell you how it's going to look, or I hope that it will look. It'll be up to you. This spirit of indifference... I'm going to offer you a simple prayer. and We might work it into our services as we move along. I, I, I think it would be good, Nikki, to lean on it at times congregationally in your home, in your own private devotion. But what if we prayed this simple prayer? God's will, nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. Would you say that with me? God's will, nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. Wow. You know, that, 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 that might mean that I've got to set something aside that God wants me to set aside for that to be done. 
that, that, that might mean that there's got to be something, a preference maybe, that has to die in me for God's will to be done. I, I confess that. Every one of us should confess that. That, that is it. God's will, nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. What might we, what might we as a church need to set aside? What needs to die in us? You know, there are a lot of churches that are going to come out of this pandemic time and say, hey, we thought so-and-so was necessary, but mm, not so much. There's some things that may that will have to be let go so that we can go forward. What are those things? It's going to take a lot of praying, isn't it? That's one of, why not? Why not, church? Why not follow Jesus' example? Why not be indifferent? to anything and everything except what God wants for us so that we can run the race with perseverance. The one that's set before us and fix our eyes on Jesus. Will you do that? Why not? Let's pray. Father, we do we do yearn for your will, for your kingdom to come here on earth, here in Williams, even as it is in heaven. Help us as a congregation to seek your kingdom. May your will be done among us. Let it be to us according to your word. May it not be our will, but your will that is done. We pray, Lord, for that will. Nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. In Jesus' name, amen.